now. Okay, well, good evening, uh, everybody. I see we have over over 100 people already uh, tuned in uh, this evening. So thank you very much to you all uh, for, for turning up and coming along to what I think uh, is, uh, is a very uh, interesting and exciting topic. Uh, just before I begin, maybe a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by uh, me, which is um, Porrick Fogarty from the Irish Wildlife Trust. Uh, the Irish Wildlife Trust, if this is your first time coming to one of our webinars, is uh, an, uh, a non-governmental organisation. And our job, as we see it, is to raise awareness of the importance of wildlife uh, to people. And um, we're, we're a charitable organization. So if you uh, are enjoying these webinars and you like uh, the work that we do, please do uh, support us by becoming uh, a member. Um, so um, you will see that, um, again, you'll know the, uh, the routine if you've been to one of these uh, webinars before, but uh, we have a great speaker for you this evening. I'll get onto that in a moment. Uh, but you will see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button and uh, you are free to put your uh, questions into the Q&A button, please, rather than the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A button. Uh, so if you have questions for Eugene at the end, uh, please uh, put it there and I will uh, get around to it. So we hope to be uh, finished by about eight o'clock and uh, Eugene's going to talk and then hopefully we'll have, a, we'll have plenty of time for, for questions and discussions. So please, please do feel free to uh, engage. So getting on to the, the matter in hand, we're going to talk about our uplands. Now, um, our uplands are, I mean, I, I, mean I, I think they're one of the most important landscapes we have in Ireland. I mean, Eugene will correct me, but I think they cover about 20% of the whole country um, uh, is, is what you might call the brown land as opposed to the green land of, of our lowlands. And uh, the uplands are frequently where we go for recreation and uh, they store a lot of carbon. They frequently tend to be peatlands. And as we're going to learn tonight, they have a, a long history of uh, farming. So um, I think they're very important landscapes for, uh, for communities and individuals. And then as a, at a national level, they also are, are vitally important. And of course, the other thing we know about our uplands is they are in, in trouble. We know that the, the habitats in our uplands tend to be uh, in bad condition. Uh, and uh, and I suppose they're contested. We have to admit that, that uh, different people have different visions for what the uplands should be. So uh, hopefully we'll illuminate some of these knotty issues uh, this evening. And I'm very happy to welcome uh, our guest this evening, Eugene Costello. Uh, Eugene is an archeologist and a historian with an interest in marginalized peoples and places, particularly the uplands. Since completing his PhD in 2016 in NUI Galway, he has worked at the University of Notre Dame, or is it Notre Dame, in the USA, and Stockholm University in Sweden. He's currently an NUI postdoctoral fellow in University College Cork, from where he comes to us this evening, where he is investigating the role of upland farmers around the north of Europe and feeding the emergence of capitalism and the socio-environmental consequences that they faced over time as a result. Now, Eugene has also, and I have it right here, has produced this beautiful book uh, about transhumans and the making of Ireland's upland since 1550. So um, Eugene will explain to you what transhumans is. He'll be much better at it than I am. Um, so I'll, without further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, to Eugene. So in your own time, Eugene. Good. Thanks very much, uh, Padraig. Uh, that was a lovely introduction and I'm delighted to be uh, invited to, to, to speak here on this uh, webinar. Um, I'll just share my screen now. Um, So is that showing up? It is, yes, very much. Good, okay, and you can all hear me, okay. Um, so um, yes, I'm based in uh, UCC, as Patrick said, and uh, I suppose I'm, I come from a farming background myself, uh, and I've always been drawn to, well, I mean, all types of farming, but particularly in uplands and the type of farming that took place there, particularly in terms of livestock grazing. Um, so here in this initial picture, it kind of encapsulates some of the things I'm going to talk about. So you have here in uh, just in, inside Killarney National Park, um, you have 
a abandoned small uh, kind of house on the lift with a holly tree growing out of it. And then you have this recent kind of landslide of material coming down and almost covering it. Um, and then further on, you can see that there is um, a woodland, oak and holly woodland with some potato ridges. Um, and then further on to the distance, you can see a, a more open mountainside. So this really kind of encapsulates some of the, the elements of Ireland's uplands today, uh, disturbance and history and ecology. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. So um, firstly, I'll talk about maybe some of the perceptions that people have had of uplands in the recent past in Ireland, uh, and then move on to look at, kind of reveal the socioeconomic importance of uplands, particularly for cattle grazing. And then I will, I suppose, review some of the human nature entanglements that resulted from uh, these, um, these human activities. Uh, but also looking at the long-term effects of uh, the so-called traditional land use. And then finally ending with how maybe perhaps we can use some of these historical lessons to contribute to upland management into the future. So in the recent past, looking at oral history and even talking to farmers today, it's clear that uplands present a degree of uncertainty for people. Um, they are open landscapes today and often difficult to terrain, um, boglands and stony ground. If it's bad weather, there's a possibility of injury. And in the more recent, in the more distant past, before the 1800s, you would also have the risk of predators, wolves um, stealing uh, or killing livestock. So there were some risks involved in these landscapes compared to lowlands for people. And we can see this even more strongly in oral traditions and folk stories from the 19th century and 20th century uh, that have been collected in various places, not just Ireland, but also in the Western Isles of Scotland and around Northwest Europe. And they kind of, together, they give the sense that there is a sort of otherness in uplands or a kind of, a kind of liminality where weird things are more likely to happen. So you've lots of stories about uh, wolf attacks, for example, in Ireland, uh, who then, turn out to be young men, a sort of metaphor. Um, you've hags or kailacha uh, turning up at uh, upland cabins in the night. Uh, and you also have um, some of these hags taking the form of a hare uh, in order to uh, steal milk from a cow, uh, which is a common European story. And worst of all, you have this water horse or ach ishke, uh, which turns up in uh, to some extent in Ireland, but mainly in the Hebrides and uh, Isle of Man. And uh, this was bad news altogether if you came across this particular uh, creature. Now, going back a little bit further, um, looking at some early modern writings, we can see that uplands are referred to, not very often, but when they are referred to, it's often in the context of cattle rearing. So you can see here, Edmund Spencer, famous English poet, said that the Irish keep their cattle and live the mo most part of the year in boolies, pasturing upon the mountain and waste wild places and removing still to fresh land as they depastured the farmer. And George Carew, who was on a military campaign in County Kerry in 1600, around the time of the Nine Years' War, he complains really that in the summer season, uh, people live and on the milk and butter of their cows grazing on the mountains and in fastness, which holds this rebellion on foot longer than otherwise it would. So he's, he's complaining here that, oh, were it not for the fact that people went away to the mountains uh, and to the woods in the mountains where they milked their cows, that we would be able to keep more control of people. So there's a sense that these are kind of wild places that they don't control. And you can see this as well in the down survey, these, these maps of conquest. Um, mountains are often referred to as bog and unprofitable mountain. Not in every case, but in many cases. In County Kerry, we can see this too, uh, also on the down survey, cold mountain boggy land, um, referred to as kind of something undesirable. Um, 
with also noticeably timber wood and shrubby wood and also some arable lands. And interestingly, they say that we could not uh, set down the particular boundaries of the farmer's lands by reason of the vastness of the barony, all the inhabitants being dead, transported or transplanted. So again, adding to the sense that these are kind of really um, uncontrolled places. But interestingly, if you take a closer look at some of these sources, you can see, for example, here in the center, uh, although it's not legible, there are hints to cattle grazing in these uplands and in a way which suggests it wasn't all just um, out of control wanderings by um, uncivilized Irish. We can see that actually people depended on these places for livestock grazing and that both socially and economically they were in many ways central to rural life in Ireland. And this was largely, I suppose, manifest in the practice of transhumance, which Podrick mentioned at the start, uh, often known as bullying in Ireland. So essentially, this is a form of livestock husbandry in which people try to take advantage of distant pastures that would not support very much growth in the winter. Um, basically, people move with their livestock from their home place to these upland areas or forest areas, graze their livestock there, be they cattle or sheep or goats, for the summer and then come back down again. And it allows more land at home to be um, spared for uh, crops and particularly for hay, which is useful for winter. Now, the question is who moved with livestock to Ireland's uplands in the past? Well, we have a very early hint from a saint's life in the 11th century, which talks about a, a farmer from County Mead uh, who is said to have brought his cattle, 100 cows, on a grazing circuit to the Wicklow Mountains, which you can see on the right. And interestingly here, this is, this is really fascinating because this is actually a reference to woodland grazing. So they talk about Dima, this is the guy, the farmer, Dima's cows were grazing in the wood in which uh, Quivine, this is St. Kevin, was concealing himself. So essentially what happens in the story is that they, they find uh, St. Kevin in the woods uh, of the Wicklow Mountains because one of the cows uh, goes over to him every day and when she comes back, she has much more milk than the other cows. Uh, so in the story, at least, this is how they find St. Kevin. But um, it tells us about how people viewed uh, livestock rearing at the time, even if the story itself is not true. Uh, so we can see that they're grazing in the woods, in the mountains, uh, that there's dairy cows, and also that there's a number of people involved. It's a herdsman, there's children, um, as well as the farmer himself. Now this changes over time. As we get into more recent periods, we can see that clearly not everybody in a community would have moved with livestock to uplands. So William Wilde, who was Oscar Wilde's father in 1836 says that the entire population of several villages in Ackle Island uh, closed their winter dwellings and drive their cattle up to the hills, migrating uh, as such. But when we look at the archaeology on the right here, on the bottom right, we can see that actually by this stage in the 1800s, there is no way that these upland seasonal villages could have accommodated everybody uh, who, from the, the lowland villages. There simply wasn't enough cabins and huts. Uh, and similarly in Connemara, we can see the same thing. Um, you have people based by the coast in the bottom left there in those green dots, and then moving at least some of the community up to these uh, hill pastures for the summer uh, in Unknockbuy and Glunan, as you can see on the map. So what we have by this stage is a division of labor whereby it's mainly young people and particularly girls that are actually migrating seasonally up to uh, hill and mountainous areas in Ireland. Uh, sometimes there was also adolescent boys and elderly women, so there was some flexibility. And this was a practice that is found elsewhere in the north of Europe. So this division of labour is really interesting because it kind of helps to explain
Thank you, Patricia. Patricia suggests somebody, Eugene, somebody asked, what are uplands? How would you define uplands? Patricia is suggesting that uplands are areas over 300 meters in height. Is that, is there an accepted definition? Um, well, I mean, there's no real one accepted definition. Um, I would say that um, I usually, in Ireland, in an Irish context, I would use, I would use the, uh, say, roughly over 250. Um, but, you know, it, re it really is a relative term. And in, uh, you know, uplands in Ireland might not be very upland in in Switzerland. So um, it's a relative term, um, and it's also a very culturally constructed term in a way. Um, bearing in mind also some of those stories. Um, you know, for example, in Connemara, the word "shee" of our mountain um, is used to refer to um, to uh, mountain land, hill land that may only be a hundred meters above sea level. So it's quite. Um, it's quite culturally constructed in that in that sense. Um, just get back to where I was. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's an interesting point there from, from Davy, who says that in Scotland, you can define uplands by altitude, but in Scotland, we have upland soil and vegetation down to sea level in the north and the northwest. So, uh, okay. Can you, you see back? that now? Okay. Yeah, very good. Okay. Off you go. Moving on. So, um, talking about uplands as kind of cultural places before we go on to the human nature entanglements. Um, basically, you know, when I mentioned that uh, it was often delegated to young people and to young women in particular, um, we can start to see the sense in those folk stories about supernatural weird things happening in uplands. Um, to some degree, they may have been cautionary tales for these young people who were quite precious to the local community. Um, there's no doubt that there is some exaggeration in those stories of, of wolves and of monsters, of course. Um, and actually, when we go and look at some of these um, folk songs that come down to us from the tradition of bullying and living seasonally in uplands, um, there is actually some more fond re reminiscences. For example, this um, song in Irish, Vermsham of Alach to the Sagart Ud de Fosme, Custante Dordig Nabalta Mura. So essentially this is a woman reminiscing about her time as a uh, uh, herder in the uplands. Uh, she's now a married woman and she's kind of, she's kind of, I suppose, cursing her lot in a way. She's, she's cursing the priest who married her and also to the, the man that brought her to this the Baltimore, to the big town. And these were not the people who, who taught me in my youth uh, when I was uh, dancing on the pastures uh, with the calves. So it's quite romantic, but nevertheless, it, it does hint at this kind of um, hidden and forgotten kind of uh, seasonal life in Ireland's uplands, which was, uh, which was not just about livestock, it was also about people. So, of course, why this was the case, it's because at this stage, men and adults were usually required at home to improve land, um, to fish if it was nearby, and also to tend to the large er areas of potatoes that they were uh, cultivating. But not only that, we can also see that women and livestock grazing in uplands in the early modern period is actually a local adaptation to a, a wider international trend. You can see here on the bottom left, there's a, this is a Dutch uh, drawing of the southwest of Ireland, of Munster, and it depicts in the background a woman milking a cow, another woman um, chur um, um, using a, um, a dash churn, and then the butter and cheese being brought down to the coast and sold to these Dutch merchants. So these traditional, if you like, communities were in fact actually caught into a wider economic system from as early as the um, 16th and 17th centuries. And the role of women um, in uplands in milking cows was actually a manifestation of this. So you can see, you know, going through this quickly, you can see there are traces of this in some upland sites. 
little uh, parts of huts in these mountains, um, which would have been used to store butter and keep it cool until it was taken down to the lowlands um, later on in the week. So you can see here in the top left, there's an example from the Galti Mountains. And in the bottom right, a small, just a small crude kind of storage structure in a hut in Ivrahach in Kerry. Also, some subtle um, manipulation of the landscape, people controlling water, building small dams to back up water in streams, bearing in mind that uplands, uh, although uh, they receive quite a lot of rainfall, they can actually be susceptible to drought too when there isn't uh, rainfall. Uh, so this was a, a mini solution in uplands um, and allowed people to, to wash their uh, clothes and also to wash their uh, dairying utensils and churns. Now, in these places, you can argue that these were kind of little human niches that were being developed in uplands over the long term. And this is, you know, a widely tested process, uh, particularly in, in Scandinavia. So with people come up, up here with their cattle every summer, you can see an accumulation of waste material, be it bedding or dung, or even byproducts from the dairying process like buttermilk. So this all kind of accumulates around these hot sites and you have the development of a kind of a special niche in terms of vegetation in these, in these spots in the uplands. And indeed, although this site is actually in the Galtee Mountains, um, if I had another site, uh, a picture from Kerry, uh, oftentimes you can come across uh, examples of Kerry slugs. Um, they tend to be fond of some of these stone structures, uh, be they relict walls or uh, the remains of huts. So you can argue that there is kind of um, human nature entanglement here at some of these sites. And you can see the same in Sweden, uh, where I've done work recently. These human made openings in this vast boreal forest. So these again were kind of summer dwellings, summer places where people went um, and where they made hay in these clearings and then also grazed cows uh, outside the clearing in the wider forest. Um, so these were anthropogenic, if you like, these were made and developed by humans, but nevertheless, uh, over time, they've actually become kind of refuges for biodiversity. So between um, uh, snakes liking to uh, take the sun on, uh, on some exposed rocks in these clearings, as I've found out during field work, and also um, uh, species rich meadows uh, being preserved in these, you know, ironically human places in the forest. So at certain times and places, I think we can say that, you know, traditional farming in inverted commas has been high nature value, if you like, but we must be careful not to idealize the past. It was not a single entity. It was a place of change. And I think that given that we are entering, you know, this so-called Anthropocene, this era of humans, I think that you know we, we should be perhaps thinking about things in a long-term way uh, and looking back into the past to see what we can learn from it. And indeed, when we when we actually look at the broader landscape, especially in Kerry, where I've 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 done work recently, you can see that there are serious environmental effects, even in these so-called pre-modern um, you know, traditional contexts. Um, so here we have um, a pollen diagram in the bottom left. And you can see that, although it's a bit complicated, you can see that um, on the left, the kind of um, striped um, area, you can see that um, here, you can see that woodland actually declines, starts to decline from 1400s onwards, and then really starts to decline from 1650s onwards. So there's, you know, there's major change happening here over time, and it's it's not static. And we get an even greater hint of this in place names. So I've uh, totted up recently the um, woodland or place names, both townlands and also minor place names that contain a hint of former presence of woodland. And there's, you know, there's lots of these. Um, there's really loads, you know, Drumdura, Ridge of the Black Oakwood, um, uh, Durini, Little Oakwoods, File Dirin, 
cliff of the Little Orkut, they're, they're really scattered everywhere in this um, peninsula in Kerry, in Ivrahach. Um, as you can see here when they're mapped, uh, so you can see the townlands are the shaded, and then the little smaller trees are kind of more minor place names within townlands. So when and how did all of these patches of woodland disappear? So now we've known for a long time that the uplands have been to some degree open from you know, the Bronze Age onwards. It depends on the region, um, but certainly in the Southwest, there has been an openness to these um, valleys since you know, roughly 1000 BC and mixed farming too, uh, and peat growth, of course, making it kind of difficult for, for trees to grow in some places. And after 1000 AD, getting into the later medieval period, you see tentative evidence of, of more livestock grazing, you know, this practice of bullying, of transhumance, and people moving up there seasonally with their cattle. But nevertheless, patches of woodland were still common. But there's a step change in the early modern period, again, keeping the focus on the southwest of Ireland and Ivrahach. Um, we can see that with the English conquest, there starts to be a lot of timber felled for the navy construction of boats. And then also um, with new landowners moving in from England and Wales, you see ironworks established in Kinmare in 1667 and also Glen Carr um, in 1670. So essentially, um, this had an impact on woodlands because in order to fuel these ironworks, they needed charcoal and charcoal was got from burning trees. And in field survey, you can see this, you know, you, you have this archaeological proxy or archaeological signal of where woodland used to be with these sites that I've uh, seen. Uh, so essentially, these are um, charcoal burning platforms. So these are kind of oval uh, shaped things. Uh, people may have seen them themselves in some uplands in Cork and Kerry and also in Wicklow. And looking at the side of them, you can see that there's charcoal almost bursting out of them. So essentially these are places that people would have gathered um, branches and trees together and built up a mound and uh, then burnt that timber. This was combined, of course, with more intensive grazing linked to that butter trade that I mentioned. But interestingly, with cow's butter going to the market, people at a local level actually re relied more so on goats. Uh, so Isaac Weld in 1807 says, there are immense herds of goats uh, fed in these mountains of Kerry, whose milk is chiefly used by the peasants for their domestic purposes. And indeed, the mother of a local farmer who would have been born in the 1910s said she didn't consume cow's milk until she was a teenager. Um, and you can see these peculiar goat enclosures in some of these uplands. And you know them because they're kind of high walled uh, and they kind of actually even curve in near the top. Uh, so these would have been to keep uh, the kids in at night uh, and they would only have been left out then after their uh, mother, mothers had been milked. Uh, and those walls slope inwards to prevent the kids, uh, the kid goats escaping at night time. So now you might say, okay, well, well, isn't there some coexistence of woodland and livestock grazing? Um, remembering that, that story about St. Kevin in the Wicklow Mountains, what evidence is there for this? Well, we do see some woodland pasture, you know, it is encouraging signs. There's 1711, we see the woods of Drumtee Joaquin in uh, Glencar. They're referred to as providing six cows grazing. And also in those place names, um, we can see uh, Oakwood of the Buttermilk, Dyr in the Blache, and then also Little Oakwood of the Herders, Dyrin in So, you know, these are, hinting at um, wood pasture. But based on the evidence, it seems that this was not sustainable over multiple decades. And as you get into the, the late 1700s, so in one case, Lord Kinmare complains that um, these people who were supposed to be looking after his woods actually grazed their cattle in the woods. And not only that, but they actually let out the woodland to other people to graze their cattle in and that they are destroying his woods at their pleasure. Now, 
basically with between the goats and the cattle, essentially you've more pressure on these uplands, uh, these upland woodlands, and the saplings are eaten, and over time the wood can't regenerate and it contracts. And we're left with, as you can see, you know, by the end of the 1800s, a very bare landscape in much of South Kerry. By the same token, some of the so-called surviving woodlands near Killarney, you know, the, the, the world famous uh, woodlands near Killarney, a lot of them are actually secondary growth. And that has been demonstrated by um, the great uh, paleoecologist Frank Mitchell. Uh, and also you can see here, indeed in the photograph, you can see potato ridges are running right under a oak and holly wood in uh, Danish Island in Kerry. So, you know, just to go into the last section of the talk quickly, I know we're uh, running on with time, but what are the implications for these, this historical information for upland management today? So, you know, we have here on this map, the special areas of conservation uh, across Ireland. Um, you know, some of them are along rivers, but a lot of them are in uplands. And you can see the one in South Kerry highlighted in, in the bottom left. And the aim of these and their management plans is essentially to maintain or to restore habitats as they were around the year 2000. So that means uh, heathlands, blanket bogs, um, meadows, um, and also um, uh, oak, holly, woodlands, what remains of them. And the aim of them is to maintain them in the long term. Uh, and that is indeed what is said in EU conservation law, that there is no time limit to this, that this, these are to be frozen effectively in time and maintained. And, you know, in a way, this is very worthy because these places, these habitats contain valuable biodiversity that is no longer to be found in many other parts of Ireland. But is it realistic? Is it realistic to try and freeze these places as it suggests in the current policy? I wonder if it is because we look at the even more recent trends in rural areas, such so as depopulation. That means less people to watch over livestock in uplands. And over you know, recent decades, that has meant increasing reliance on mountain sheep who are left to graze in uplands. And we don't have people moving up seasonally anymore. Uh, we don't have young women going up. That day is gone. And indeed, you know, whether by coincidence or not, um, we do see upland habitats actually in a bad state uh, at the present. So blanket bog is deteriorating. Um, that was in a most recent report. Also, we have greater erosion, um, slope instability due to intensive grazing, and that makes um, erosion more likely to happen, as you can see in the bottom left. Of course, there's nobody now to clean up after these erosion events anymore because, um, uh, because these houses are now abandoned. Woodland may have a role to play in carbon capture and in preventing further erosion, like we saw in the photograph. But how and where can it regenerate, given that this is an inhabited landscape, without compromising the carbon stores of blanket bog that are remaining and those uh, mountain heats that are conserved in EU policy? Well, actually, this historical research may provide a hint as to where they might regenerate. The place names, when you map them, we can see that there is a preponderance of place names on steep rocky slopes and also even on higher cliffs and fissures in the mountains. So this is this is up until the 1700s and 1800s, this is where the woodland was located. It wasn't covering the landscape. It was in these select places, these spaces, these rocky spaces um, that are neither heathland today nor blanket bog. And when we zoom in a bit to a particular valley, we can see this too. Um, so you can see clearly, you know, on the purple is the what is now heathland, and also the bogland is in the brown. But we have this, if you like, this this space of opportunity in the centre, and the archaeological evidence really hints at that. So these red dots are actually the locations of those charcoal burning platforms. So that provides a kind of proxy, as I said for the former 
location of woodland up until the 1660s when it started to be destroyed en masse. In addition to that, in addition to pointing out places where we might allow for responsible um, habitat change, there's also the importance of local cooperation. And I think historical research really brings that out. Although traditional farming was clearly capable of habitat damage, as I've, as I've explained uh, at length, nevertheless, um, there is a suggestion that local forums and cooperation help to, to kind of mitigate the worst excesses of uh, intensive grazing in the past. Um, you know, and you can see that in a very poignant account from Donegal in the 1940s. This person had been talking about how in the past there was a local brehav or um, kind of informal judge to see that nobody sent too many cattle to the mountains. But by the 1940s, he says, there's no one now to see that there is any equation. The poor send what they can and the rich eat up the grass the poor are unable to graze. So I think just finishing off that there may be an opportunity here to maybe, you know, with the, the emergence of these EU funded upland partnerships um, like Kerry Life uh, uh, in, in the recent past and also now um, Wild Atlantic Nature and many others, you know, in, in Ashon and Connemara and of course the Burn, that maybe with these kind of regionally focused, local focused partnerships, that there's maybe an opportunity here to kind of perhaps regain some of that, um, that local discussion and also to make use of these historical snippets of information that I'm offering. So to conclude, if we're talking about rewilding, there are clearly obstacles to that. These uplands are still inhabited by people and also rewilding might compromise the existing conservation status of these heaths and blanket bogs. The idea of high nature value farming offers a kind of compromise, a socio-environmental compromise, which tailors to both, if you like. But it's not clear what baseline of traditional practices we should adopt. Um, you know, as I've shown, we cannot point to the pre-1950s and say, oh, that, that there now was sustainable, because it wasn't. There was change happening all the time. And I think that if we were to do that and paint the past as something that is uh, happy and sustainable, that might lead to unrealistic expectations about what might be we might achieve in the in the future. It gives rise to the belief that we can actually freeze these habitats if we can just get back to that traditional way. But I think that actually the past is more useful if we accept it as a complex place that's 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 co-evolving between humans and nature, and that it contains both positive and negative lessons on disturbance and also on stability, something that we can, that we can, I suppose, derive um, sort of pick and mix lessons, um, selective lessons from different times, rather than just pointing to one baseline and say, that's it, that's what we've got to aim for. I think we should kind of accept that our habitats are going to change and, if possible, use selective lessons from the past to help to guide it. So, I'll finish there and sorry for the shameful um, or shameless plug at the end, but that's the book that Project was referring to and uh, it's a bit dear, so uh, there is a discount with that BB135 thing code on the website, so um, that makes it a bit more affordable. Um, and I have an article as well, which is open access, um, uh, free to read online about um, the role of the past in upland conservation. Um, I can send that as an email to people if they want it. So, Gurmina Malguv, and uh, I look forward to any questions. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that, uh, Eugene. That was that was really uh, fascinating. Um, do you want to turn your camera back on there so we can see? Are you able to do that? And uh, I will remind uh, people, uh, if you have a question, please put it into the Q&A box rather than the chat. And I will keep an eye on the, on the questions. Um, and just while, while I'm uh, looking through those, uh, Eugene, you might, um, I, I haven't quite finished your book, but I've got about 90% through it. And um, so it, your, your book starts around 1550, so qu quite a long time ago. And um, 
even though I, I think I've only got about 20 pages left to read, it's mostly about cattle. It's mostly about people's stewardship of cattle in the uplands. And I mean, these days we don't associate our uplands with cattle at all. We associate them with sheep. So, I mean, wh where did sheep come into the picture uh, is, is number one. And maybe another side to that um, is about fire. I mean, we, we, we have a problem uh, in the last couple of years with fire. I mean, has your research um, uncovered anything about the role in fire in, in historic times uh, in the uplands? Um, well, so regarding fire, um, you know, th there are some, there has been some work done recently on fire. Now, that is mainly by paleoecologists, paleoecologists and um, there was some work done in Trinity College Dublin recently on fire. Um, uh, Donna Hawthorne, if I remember the name correctly, yeah, I think it was Donna Hawthorne. Um, under Fraser Mitchell did a PhD on fire management in the past in uplands and um, from what I could see from that it, see, it suggested that there were an increasing frequency of fire um, in the last 700 years and obviously then it goes up another level um, in the recent past you know in, in the last um, you know 100 years or so. Um, there are very few references to you know explicit references to farmers going out and actually um you know having a fire regime and saying you know this is how we manage them and we set this fire at this time of the year and this kind of thing i really you know although it, there is that evidence in the you know the kind of the scientific paleoecology uh, those cores that they take in the bogs they have picked up on charcoal um, but i myself in in the you know looking at oral history and stuff i haven't seen any mentions yet so much of of um of uh, you know you know fire regimes although you know clearly um you know um given that those fires appear to become more frequent during the little ice age um which was kind of a tended to be a stormy period i there are you know a lot of them are almost certainly not natural fires they would have been started by people um but you're right yeah cattle a lot of cattle a lot of cattle um i don't focus so much on um uh sheep on the book because really it seems to be uh, that it is not until the, you know, the mid to late nineteenth century that sheep, the Scottish mountain sheep, become dominant on a lot of uplands. Uh, it varies from place to place, of course, and it depends on what landlord was 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 there. Uh, they had a major say in what happened. Um, but in you know, in the Galtees, they come in in the eighteen sixties, seventies. Donegal around that time too. In Kerry, um, it's a bit more mixed. Uh, you know, there's there's goats there until until relatively recently. And also cattle, um, so it, it's it's mixed. Um, but yeah, the dominance of sheep is certainly not something that, that was the case up and before the eighteen sixties or seventies. Somebody is asking here. Uh, Terry is asking, uh, what about upland farming, uh, not as seasonal grazing, but where there are villages and tillage in uplands uh, as late as the seventeen hundreds? I suppose he means like. Um, not the transhumance or the the shifting patterns of the more more permanent settled farming mm. activity yeah de de definitely yeah so, so um well I, I didn't really have time to go into it there but so i mentioned like you know kind of the the landscape the uplands being a bit more open from the bronze age onwards and um you know it seems that that activity you know in the bronze age um in bc and also early medieval times you know early Christian times, uh, you know, the, the first millennium AD, a lot of that activity is, seems to be associated with year round, kind of more substantial activity. You have the remains of these, you know, uh, these cashels, these small ring forts, field systems, uh, you know, ohm stones, rock art. That's, that's not so much seasonal stuff. That's people there living on a year round basis before, um, before we'll say the, the blanket bog became uh, as extensive as, as it is now. Um, not with, so a lot of that kind of uh, fades away, but nevertheless, you do have um, you know permanent settlement continuing to some extent. There's little hints of of cereal cultivation uh, in some upland pollen records in the later medieval period and early modern period. Little hints that people may have been you know occasionally living on a year-round basis in these places as a as a way of maybe reducing risk. Something happens in the lowlands; they move up to the uplands and live there for a few years, just times of conflict. But it isn't really until, I suppose, the 1700s and 1800s 
that you really get into that the the the, the second really big wave of people living on a year-round basis in uplands and in fact that actually is what uh, is one of the nails in the coffin of of transhumance or, or bullying in that people start to occupy these bully sites on a year-round basis they turn them into farms uh, and actually that is the origin of many hill farms today in Connemara and Donegal that they actually you know 200 years ago uh, were probably seasonally occupied um Somebody uh, is asking, Mose here is asking a question about depopulation. And he says depopulation might stop if people were to be employed looking after the uplands. And I suppose that that is leading to a question I had as well, because you've looked at in your book, you, you look at at the beginning of your book, you talk about Scotland and uh, I think you mentioned some of the other uh, countries in Britain. And and obviously you've worked in Sweden. I mean, is this um, is this a, it's, it's, it's kind of a European it's not even confined to Europe, is it? Depopulation trends towards cities. Is, has any country booked the trend? In terms of depopulation, um, I mean, to be honest, I have, I have in your, I don't know about outside Europe. It'd be too difficult, too big a survey to do. I am um, off the top of my head, but in Europe, you no, know, it seems to be a general, a general trend. I'm afraid, and I say that as someone who like grew up on a farm, like um, so. But nevertheless, there's different rates of change. You know, in, in some countries, there's much more services in rural areas. You know, in, in Norway, albeit it's a very wealthy country um, and they get a lot of their money from oil, nevertheless, they have an uh, attitude in Norway whereby you, you, you should be able to access any service no matter where you are in the country. Uh, but in Sweden, just over the border, it's not quite like that. Um, so, and in Sweden, depopulation has been very, very severe in rural areas. More, more so than in Ireland. So, you know, it, it depends on the country, but I am, it seems to be a general trend, but it, it, it doesn't have to be inevitable. You know, nothing is inevitable. Um, change is inevitable, but the type of change is not inevitable. Mm. Uh, but it does seem like a, like a lot of uh, governments are facing the same kind of policy challenges. Um, Gerard uh, mentions that uh, there were clearances in Scotland. There were the Highland clearances, were, I think, were. Uh, particularly traumatic period in Scottish history. And he's asking, did the Great Famine have a defining change on how the uplands were farmed here? Um, yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. And obviously there's the documentary on tonight about the famine, so that's very timely. Um, so from my viewpoint, um, the main, I suppose, in terms of intensification, the famine doesn't e interrupt the trend of uh, increasing livestock numbers. In fact, it maybe kind of accelerates it a little bit because it disrupts the social structures that held, uh, you know, true commonage together. Uh, and after the famine, then with some of these, um, you know, communal settlements, you know, that, that again, that was mentioned in the, in the documentary last week, that there were people living in nucleated settlements, that they get broken up after the famine. And of course, that does major damage to the, the social structure. Uh, and, you know, people have less reason then to cooperate with each other. And then indirectly, then that affects the way in which people graze the uplands. Because um, uh, as the man said in the 1940s, there's, if there's no equation between the people, then it's, it's more easy for certain people to graze more than others. Um, but then... Uh, you know, I, I also you could say that in some cases, you know, maybe um, with the abandonment of some farms that um, it did lead to the, you know, vegetation recolonizing some abandoned upland farms in some places, you know, um, in particular Bracken, you know, Bracken tends to be attracted big time to abandoned uh, settlements. So in terms of vegetation, that would have had an effect. But uh, it's mainly demography that the uh, famine affects, and it, it seems to be an indirect on indirect uh, effect on upland farming through its effects on social structure and demography, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and um, uh, Dara uh, is asking, um, could you speak a little bit the origins of transhumance or bullying in Ireland? Is it possible to identify when it was introduced to Ireland and were there key differences or similarities with the practice in Europe? Um, so, well, it's very difficult to say when it was introduced, you know, 
and also whether it was introduced and whether it was a, a, a local, you know, innovation, um, you know, that uh, you have uh, people developing these forms of seasonal movement in many different contexts independently, you know. Um, but so the, the earliest historical reference to it is, uh, you know, is from the, the late first millennium AD. That's, you know, there's hints to it in those old Irish kind of law tracks. Uh, and also, you know, that Saint's Life uh, for of Saint Kevin, which was written in the 11th century. You know, you, you, in other parts of the Europe, they have been able to go back further because they have done um, what you call, um, they call it isotopic analysis. So that, that, that basically means that they take samples from animal bones, animal bones that date to that time, you know, the Bronze Age or whatever prehistory, and they can tell that that animal was drinking water in a different geological environment for a certain part of the year. And that gives uh, an isotopic signal, you know, in, in strontium or whatever it is, or even sometimes in oxygen. So that's uh, in some countries in Europe, they have been able to uh, uh, identify uh, seasonal movement, at least, um, you know, at an early period. But we haven't done that yet in Ireland, but hopefully we will. As regards differences, uh, one very interesting difference uh, between transhumance in uh, Ireland and actually Northern Europe as a whole and transhumance in, in uh, the Alps and the Mediterranean is that actually it's usually men who, lo who look after uh, the livestock in, uh, in Southern Europe, at least, you know, in the last 200 years. Um, it's, it's usually a male tradition. And I think maybe that's perhaps because they were traveling longer distances there and it was perhaps seen as a, a, riskier, a riskier journey. Um, possibly. Um, so yeah, the scale of scale is the big difference and also the gender of people involved. Um, you, you mentioned, this is my question now, uh, Eugene, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk about wolves, you threw it in there that, uh, and I noticed from your study period from 1550, I mean, farmers would have been on these hills living with wolves for, you know, at least until the late 1700s. Did you find any evidence about how farmers uh, managed to protect their livestock or how they they lived alongside wolves during that time um yeah that's a good question so i um well i've been looking out for that in the archaeology of the folklore is more difficult because you know it's usually just these kind of these tropes about wolves that they remember but not actually how to deal with wolves but in the archaeology you can see that like around some some bully sites uh, there's, I'm thinking one in particular in, in Karna in, in, in South Connemara, you have the, the remains of these kind of low kind of enclosures, you know, minor kind of small enclosures around um, some hut sites. And I, you know, I've been tying with the idea that these may actually have been um, enclosures for the cows, that they, they brought cattle into these enclosures at night time you know, for security. Uh, obviously, it was, you know, it was more difficult for a wolf to attack them if they were, if they were in an enclosed space. Uh, and there's definitely, you know, now that I said, there is actually, you know, folklore evidence in some places to suggest that cattle were brought, at least brought close to the buoy sites at, at night. And certainly that they enclosed the calves at night uh, in these even smaller pins. So I think that those, you know, that those enclosures may be a remnant of that. And in, in Sweden, you know, there's, uh, there's stories of, you know, women, um, you know, having to try and, it was their job to effectively try and scare away bears even, you know, and as well as wolves. And it, there's been hints that perhaps the the, the breeds of, of cattle that they had were a bit more, um, uh, you know, savvy or whatever as regards, uh, you know, watching out for things. You know, obviously dairy cattle now have been bred to be placid. Over the course, pl being placid may have been a slight disadvantage in, um, you know, in pre-modern times if there was predators, or predators around. Fascinating. I have two more questions for you before we wrap up. <clears throat> One is from Lorcan O'Toole here, who you probably know from the Golden Eagle Trust. And uh, Lorcan is asking, uh, do you think there could have been a Bronze Age economy in Irish uplands based on the harvesting and trading of Irish Scots pine resin? He suspects there's a lot to learn from Bronze Age history in Irish uplands, and it is not entirely impossible <clears throat> Excuse me, that Dira for woodland which I thought was oak, was derived from Dora or Dora, woodlands that were targeted for their sap or their resins or the tears of the tree. Is that familiar to you? Um, well, I haven't come across it before. I mean, like, for Scots pine, I suppose it's possible, but what, 
I mean, definitely they were using the resources that were there in the woodlands. Like, I think so. But the question is whether it was, um, whether it was, you know, commercial in scale, you know, that's another matter. And, um, you know, there are long distance trade, there is long distance trade in Bronze Age Europe. There's no doubt about that, just because we don't have historical evidence for it. Um, but usually what people talk about is, um, you know, trade in kind of prestige goods, you know, between very important people, um, you know, like uh, gold, gold objects being moved. But certainly, you know, they've talked about, um, you know, in Scandinavia, they, they talk about, there's a lot of new evidence for um, pre-Viking, um, um, you know, you know, um, amber and stuff being, uh, being, being traded, and there's actually fuel trade in that part of the world. So, you know, I think, yeah, possibly we have underestimated the resources that were being coming out of Ireland before the medieval period. Thanks, Natural but, resources. Just, just on the, on the, on the wolves, um, Daniel has asked, was there any evidence of them having dogs uh, in the hills with them that might have been guard dogs? Yeah, I know that's a great question. I've often wondered about that, but I, I like, I, I actually haven't found that many references to dogs in the folklore. Um, I know the people, so it depends, I suppose, on the on the livestock. Um, I know that, like, well, I was up in, it was in the Carp Carpathians a few years ago, and they, where they were herding cattle, and they had one person at the front of the herd, and another person way off at the back, and they had no dogs, and it was cattle. Uh, but I was in Romania and they had dogs, obviously, because it was sheep and they were kind of wolf dogs uh, and they have them in other places too. But, you know, yeah, I'd love to, like, that's that's a, that's something that um, I'd love to find out more about that. Um, I actually, maybe going back through the archaeological records of animal bones to pick out, are there any particularly big dog breeds that could be pointed out as, as wolf hounds? But no, it's a great question and needs to be, that needs to be looked at more. Yeah, fascinating. Obviously, a lot more we, we, we still to be discovered, I think, of in this area. Um, just finally, uh, there's a lot of people asking about your, your paper, and we'll, we'll post a link to that um, on our Twitter feed for anybody who's looking for, your, for your, uh, the paper that you published there recently. And just uh, on that, um, you say in your paper about how you feel this historical ecology helps to explain the lack of success for conservation policy in Irish uplands, and you you have some recommendations. I mean, just to just to finish off your talk, uh, tonight, you know, what would you like to see happen? How would you like this this you know great insight, this great information that you're gathering here? And obviously, there's a lot more to be learned. I mean, how would you like to see this uh, seep into conservation management and biodiversity management? Um, well, so I would say that, you know, what I've done in Kerry might ask as a case study. Obviously, you can't do in-depth research in every valley in the country to find out the history of every single valley. Um, but even without that, there's a lot of existing information that can be tapped into um, to build up a general picture of, you know, woodland decline or when livestock farming changed. So I would essentially, you know, I would hope that maybe that uh, with these local partnerships, that if there is some flexibility involved and that, you know, obviously there's maybe things being trialed about, you know, allowing small patches of woodland to grow, that historical research research could help to make sure that those things take place in the in places where there is historical precedent, precedent for it. You know what I mean? Uh, and and not, not in places where, you know, that have, can be demonstrated as uh, long-standing blanket bog or long-standing uh, heat. Um, and also then as well, so that, that's kind of more, I suppose, guiding where, uh, you know, woodland regeneration might happen. But also then as well, I, I mean, aside from like concrete stuff, you know, heritage, you know, these places are lived in by people and cultural heritage, you know, sometimes, sometimes is a, is a, is a, is as big a, uh, uh, a hook for people as natural heritage, even though I you know it's a, it's a silly distinction to make, but sometimes it does grab people. So in a way, it can it could help to bring people into the fold and not feel that okay, this wild Atlantic way is just a wild Atlantic way. There's there's no people for in this wild Atlantic way. It's it's a, it's a wilderness supposedly. That it, just to reassure them, to reassure people that there is space for people as well as. Uh, uh, as well as nature, and the, 
the history can, I suppose, demonstrate that, uh, as well as, you know, be, as well as offer cautionary lessons about, you know, not to go too crazy with uh, intensification. <laughs> Very good. Well, I mean, that's that's a, a, a nice note to leave it on, uh, maybe. Um, so look, Eugene, thanks very much for your talk. Um, and thank you very much to all the people uh, who've tuned in tonight. We've got a really fantastic uh, reaction. We couldn't get to all the questions and all the comments. The talk has been recorded. Uh, we will post it to our YouTube channel later in the week, and you'll find all of our webinars that we have done so far. Um, this year uh, on our YouTube channel. And I think there's a link to all the webinars also on our webpage. Um, I would just like to say um, also, again, if you do uh, enjoy this series and you support the work of the Irish Wildlife Trust, please do consider joining and becoming a member. Um, I want to wish you all a happy Christmas and uh, enjoy the holidays. And um, I'm very much looking forward to 2021. And I think uh, Corona or no Corona, I think we'll be keeping up our, our our, uh, webinar series. I think it's a really great way to uh, to engage with people um, all over the country. So just once more, uh, thanks very much, Eugene. It's really been uh, fascinating. And as I say, I'll, we'll, we'll post a link to uh, to your paper and your on your work on Twitter. So uh, thanks again. Thanks and very much, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye bye, Slan.